will perturb some of you and contribute to congestion. And there are many of us here that have mentioned that the reasons that we're here in Summerfield is because we choose to live here because of the rural character and lack of congestion. And in fact, uh, something interesting uh, occurred this past year. Uh, as all of this is going on in previous meetings, Mr. Couch's team conducted two surveys. And uh, in the first survey, they uh, did a survey of uh, who thought we need more housing types, opportunities in uh, Summerfield. And the result of people who thought we needed uh, uh, more character uh, of housing was 39%. That was their own survey. They weren't sure they liked that survey because they said they uh, weren't sure that people weren't uh, answering multiple times, and so they did another survey. And in the second survey, they said, well, if you're like the 39% who think we need more housing types, then what types would you like? So they were already rejecting 61% of the people. And then even with that, uh, the respondents, they advertised in trying to promote apartments that more than 47% say that they would be open to apartments. Well, the last time I checked, more than 47% is not majority. So even trying to limit it to 39%, only 47% of those thought that we needed apartments. Now I was wondering why we're at this meeting, why this meeting is being held, and uh, apparently it's because of the threat of de-annexation. Uh, if the town council is to represent the people, why then would we consider this change to, to the UDO? And apparently it's a threat to the annexation. And if so, why are these elected representatives not representing the election? <coughs> and I, this has been mentioned many times in the past and, uh, by other speakers. And I think uh, we would really like you to consider what the people think that puts you in office and what you're there for. Thank you very much. John Terrell will be next. John Hamilton, 6204 Riata Drive. Um, can everyone hear me? John Hamilton, 6204 Riata Drive. I am just so proud of everyone here that I live with all of you because the intelligence coming out of your mouths is wonderful. I, uh, Marty, by the way, Marty Mayer was stuck earlier. He, he's actually a scientist. Um, and the, the things everyone has said, I have nothing really to say, but I, everything that is said, I am behind. I think we need to be very careful with all of this. And there's a lot of people that aren't here right now. Uh, I've been out in the community. I've talked to hundreds of people probably in the last, let me make sure it stays with me. Uh, used to walking around when I talk. Uh, I've talked to a lot of people in the last month. I'd say hundreds, and over the last two months, close to a thousand. And so far, 80 to 90%, and that's being... Uh, very cautious with that. 80-90% would rather take, don't want this amendment, and a lot of them would rather take their chances with the de-annexation. So, <laughs> because I understand a lot of folks didn't want to come tonight because they feel like it's a done deal already. And instead of coming here giving their voice, they're going to give their voices on the ballot. So again, be very, very careful with what you do here tonight. Um, that's all I have to say, and again, just very proud of everybody for coming out, and round of applause for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mary Corlapper, you'll be next at Mr. Terrell. I am Tom Terrell, 230 North Elm Street in Greensboro. I am here tonight on behalf of David Couch as his attorney, and I'm joined tonight by my law partner, Mr. Patrick King. I had prepared another statement to make, but I have changed that to make a shorter comment. Mr. Kane and I have been working many, many hours through several meetings, several nights, over a weekend, in a very short time span to agree on some language to a text amendment that would enable Mr. Couch to reasonably develop land that he owns. I was under the impression that we had worked together. I was under the impression that we were collaborating. I was under the impression that we 
had got as close as we could to a consensus. But for the last five days, I have sought very specific answers to certain very specific issues. All of my outreach to the town has been unanswered. My calls have been unanswered, my texts have been unanswered, and my emails have been unanswered. I have been excluded from communication. I am concluding from that silence that once this hearing is closed, and I hope I'm wrong about this, but I can only conclude that once the hearing is closed, the council may make numerous changes to this text amendment for the sole purpose of making a high quality project economically infeasible and functionally impractical. Since I cannot speak after the public hearing closes, I have only this opportunity to say that any substantive changes at all that are unilaterally imposed on this text amendment, and especially substantive changes that challenge the economics uh, the project's economic vi viability and quality are contrary to the openness and to the collaboration that we commit to. Thank you all for um, listening and being here and doing what you do. I know everyone has spent many hours um, trying to get this thing sorted out. My first question is, when you go for office, I wonder, where is your moral compass? Your civic duty seems to not be for the people, but for a man. We've spent too many nights doing these meetings and speaking about all of this, when there are so many pressing issues. In our town alone, our schools, suck. There's no better word for that. They're in dire need of leadership. It's terrible for the children, and it's even more detrimental to kids who don't have two families working so that they can get the education that they deserve to make decisions for us as we get older. And there's no, nothing in this thing about additional schools for growing Summerfield the way you all want to grow it. I moved here 26 years ago, roughly, um, because I wanted to live in a rural community. I didn't want to live in the city. I love a well accepted community, and we are trying to get rid of that. I mean, this document is almost like giving the cow away with the milk. I say no to this document because it is not fair to the citizens of Summerfield who have lived here all their lives or have moved here because they wanted to get out of the city. It's not fair to families who have just gotten their homes in Summerfield, they have small children and then there's going to be construction everywhere. How are they going to be having the joys? Also, we have beautiful wildlife. It's just mind-boggling that we can be bullied by builders and developers to come and take our town away and shame on, on these documents for not sticking up for the people of Summerfield who live here, but people that don't live here and will never live here to come in and just blow our town into pieces. Not to mention the fact that if, if Summerfield Farms is granted and they want to put in storm drains, sewer, and water, where's the granite? Do you know where the granite is? Are you just going to blow up places to try and dynamite the granite out so you can do that and have sinkholes all over the place? I mean, I think it's a possibility. But where's that in any of these documents? They're not seeing the picture. They're seeing what they want to do. Thank you. Betty uh, Nash will be next. Kyle Stahl, 
7823 Wilson's Farm Road in Summerfield. Um, I spoke earlier as well, but I'd like to respond to a couple of the comments by the uh, planning board. Um, anybody who thinks that a development like this and the adoption of a zoning designation like this will result in vibrant, thriving little village community is detached from reality. <laughs> Before. I have worked on numerous, I work in land development, I have worked on projects like this, one in particular that is almost exactly the same. And what it results in is more undesirable infrastructure, more congestion, and a more transient community with less investment in the community by the people living in it. And as somebody who just came from Fisher Park in downtown Greensboro, that is not desirable. That community is riddled with apartments and if you ignore the people living in the park, and it's just a lot of transients, a lot of people just moving through. It makes the place much less desirable to live, and that's what we're going to get here. So we're going to get a large population of people who are just here for however long they have to be, and then they can move on, rather than people who are actually vested in the schools, in the way the community looks, in the actions of, of bodies like the council and the planning board. So I, I just wanted to say that, and for everybody who was horrified of, um, of the annexation, and I've said this before, like, well, working a language in a document like this and modifying clauses here and there is like massaging a malignant tumor. Like, it's not going to accomplish anything. At the end of the day, all the exceptions possible will be made, and there's a lot of putting off responsibility to people who are in roles in the future. I've been giving a lot of assurance that people who are in these roles 20 years from now will make the correct decisions. They won't make exceptions. Well, based on what I've seen here tonight so far, I don't understand why I put any confidence in that. So, I didn't prepare a statement. God bless all of you who did, and all the research that the people in this community have put into this. But, I will say, I don't like the idea of the annexation any more than anybody else. But, if the, if the skids have been greased, if that is the inevitable consequence of this being rejected, then I say, make the supposedly conservative legislature of this state engage in a pretty unprecedented level of tyranny, destroying a small town and overriding local government. Make them do it, if that's what they're willing to do. Make them betray their values. If they're willing to do that, then what hope did I ever have? And as I've said, I know Phil Berger hates me. I know he hates everybody in this room. I know David Couch hates me. I know he hates everybody in this room. It's wonderful. I'm hoping that you all don't hate me as well. And you've got a chance to me. Thank you.
to keep crime under control. I just, uh, I I'm a grandmother, and I, I love my grandchildren, and I know that all of the people here love their children and grandchildren. I just want them say, I also want to say that the town council folks are not against us. They are for us. They are on our side. And I want to say thank you to them for all the hard work that you put in to trying to keep this growth down. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Nash. Thank you, Crawford. And that's the Jane Crawford for the city of Sunderland. Wayne Crawford, 1106, at the Seattle Women's Review West. Two subjects, two topics. Um, I mentioned earlier that the Senate represents one half of one third of our state governing bodies. Um, Believe it or not, this, the, um, the government courts have actually talked about this subject we're talking about tonight. Here's why. According to annotated statutes, a case called Allred versus City of Raleigh, there's a um, clause in the end, or there's a section of the annotated statute that says, determine the validity of an amending ordinance. Basic rule to determine the validity of an amending ordinance is the same rule used to determine the validity of the original ordinance. So we have an amending ordinance, amending ordinance tonight. We had a prior amending ordinance and one prior to that. Uh, it, it, that so those prior ones are used to determine the validity of this. Legislative body must act in good faith. Must act in good faith. It cannot act arbitrarily and capriciously. If the conditions existing at the time of the proposed change, the current one, are such that it would have been originally justified last time, the legislative body has the power to act. Three of the five council members here tonight have voted against this ordinance twice from the council table. And Jim, if I recall correctly, you voted against it twice from the planning board. So conditions have not changed. There has not been a change. A threat is just a threat. A change is what happens after the threat is executed. Nothing has changed. Uh, Councilman uh, Linda Bain, quoting the news and record, says, you've made a motion to amend the town's unified development board and say the proposal last time was inconsistent with the adopted plan. Quote, this is the wrong tool for our small town with a limited government and it's in direct conflict with the values and rural character of our community. Are we acting arbitrarily and capriciously to pass this tonight? Are we acting in good faith if we pass this tonight? What do you say? I would like to hear you speak to this. How do you reconcile a decision to approve this with past decisions that don't? Because the courts have talked about this, and they're making courts talking about it again specifically to this issue. Uh, the other matter, how much I got? 38 seconds. So, uh, statute 160D604, gotta go fast. It says, upon completion, the planning board shall make a written recommendation regarding the adoption of the reg regulation to the governing board. The government board, governing board shall not hold its required hearing, this hearing, or take action until it has received a recommendation regarding the re regulation from the planning board. I sat here and watched the entire during the 10 minutes break and y'all were meeting. I did not see a document passed from the planning board to this board. I would like, on behalf of the people, I would like to see that document from the planning board passed to this board that makes what we're doing right now legal. Thank you. Yeah. Sunderman, uh, Henson Forest Drive, Summerfield. So I'm not going to repeat anything that anybody's already said, although I agree with everything. I think it'd be ridiculous for us to pass the text amendment. I mean, for two years, it's been clear that nobody wants it except for the commercial developers that might make money off of Couch's project and Couch, and, sorry, and Couch himself. Um, giving it to the text amendment, first of all, as opposed to if he wins the de-annexation, it enables others to do the same thing if they own a certain amount of property. So why would we open the door, the floodgates for several uh, families to do something like this? And if you give in to his demands, and now I'm specifically referring to Couch, of course, 
uh, it's, he's always going to demand more, and he's always going to have expensive lawyers to fight you on it. So worst case scenario, if we were to lose, then he'd be Greensboro's problem. But at least we'd go down fighting instead of giving him everything. <laughs> Yeah, and then as far as the one from the other board saying something about being able to get milk, when we bought our homes, we knew we couldn't walk to get milk, and we made that choice. And I've had people, when they've said to me, literally, it's people that have looked at houses in Hensel Forest, say, well, how far, one of my girlfriends said, how long does it take you to get to, to shopping? And I said, well, I have Gap.com in my house. Ask me how the schools are. Ask me if my kids are safe. I said, that's why we moved here. I never cared about how long it takes me to get to the Gap. But like I said, the text in the middle opens the doors to more than just couch. And couch will always argue with you. And burger, we all know he's been bought. We can look and see how much, you know, wasn't his fundraiser on couch's property? Let him rename his property, the Farms of Greensboro. Let him be their problem. Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing that's been said, and like I said, there's nobody that, that doesn't have a vested interest that speaks on his behalf, that just thinks it's a great idea for the community. Oh, and by the way, oh, we'll get apartments immediately, but 25 years from now, I could take my great-grandchildren to get ice cream, maybe. And, you know, and in the meantime, for 25 years, I'll give the apartments and the trucks. Oh, that's, that's enticing. That's it. Thank you, Ms. Simmons. Uh, this closes our public hearing. Thank all of you who shared. Uh, uh, Tim, can you, could you allow for... one more comment? I know I didn't sign up. Can, can I speak just for, I'll take one minute. Is that possible? If not, I'll go back. Go ahead, Tom. <clears throat> Tom Wendell, 3406 Winslet Drive. I just wanted to make a comment which, uh, related to uh, Mr. Terrell, where he gave you an ultimatum. I think that was kind of, uh, it was pretty rough. He accused all of you for not communicating with you, with him, uh, and, and so on, as he mentioned, uh, kind of threw you all under the bus, in my opinion. And the ultimatum now is, if you make any changes to this, its deal is done, if there was a deal. But I'm just saying, if you got any fortitude, I think it's time for you all to, uh, uh, to do what's right. That's all. Thank you. Represented by an attorney, you you can no longer uh, speak specifically to the person, and the attorney can't speak specifically to us. It has to be attorney to attorney or to our staff. So I would pose the question to our staff. Uh, you know, in response to what Mr. Terrell said, uh, I think the council would like to hear your comments. I'm not aware of uh, anything along those lines that has transpired. I'll, I'll say from my level, um, and I've been away at a conference uh, since last Saturday until last night, but I haven't seen that I have missed any uh, direct messages. You did not see or you did? I, I have not, I am not aware of any missed messages sure. directly to me. Can we ask you, okay. who did you reach out to that didn't respond to you? I, I, I can tell you that there were two emails to me since last Friday that I did not respond to because 